and my dog went crazy in the middle of the night. I looked up, it was like two or three in the morning or something like that. And the door opened and this woman kind of floated in and was there at the foot of my bed. And it looked like she was trying to say something and couldn't, the dogs going nuts wow. and all that stuff. And then she kind of floated back out of the room after a while, leaving the door open. And I ran down the hall to my parents' room, knocked on the door. And my mom said years later, um, she said, you were white as a sheep eyes this big. scenes like people would destroy your equipment things in, like in, that in our era man they would sabotage your gear um i mean all of those skinny you know shiny happy people skinny tie band yeah. guys like i mentioned all of them were on heroin all of them were jacked up they're singing these jangle pop like happy songs they were the most messed up people i have ever been well, around that's what i'm wondering it's like you you see that and i often wonder like as somebody who was younger being you did you look at that and go this is not the this is not the business my dad was in. This is not what I want to be in. What like, I, well, didn't I, it turn you off? To, no, to me, it was a cautionary tale. You know, I got great examples. There's only one thing better than a great good example, and it's a great bad example. And it depends <laughs> on how you're programmed. Like for me, jail was never appealing. Yeah, me you either. know, getting arrested was never attractive. Yeah, you know, it it just wasn't. I, I just. I love I, being a free man. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wasn't the kind of kid that, you know, would, was getting into trouble when I was growing up, torturing the neighborhood animals and blowing up mailboxes. I had friends or people I knew in the neighborhood that did. Matthew and I were playing drums and bass in a hayloft above the barn at the family house. When they were doing that, we were doing that. Yeah. And uh, all we wanted to do was do it at the highest of levels. We didn't know the when. We always knew the what we wanted. Yeah. Um, and, and the how vacillates, it changes, but you know, it, and I'm saying you have, some days are harder than others. They really are. Some days when you, you know, you, you get a phone call that doesn't go your way and you're, you're really putting a lot of eggs in that basket and you get disappointing news. Um, but or, and, and in your case, your, your band is two people. What happens if all of a sudden Matthew has a change of heart, doesn't feel like performing anymore, doesn't have the pack, like what? You know, all, all kinds of things that could end I your life. I always felt, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. I, I was at a breakfast meeting this morning uh, with our wonderful attorney, and he was talking about a band that he had put together for a label here in Nashville. This is not all that long ago. It was a couple years ago. And they were two contest winners from The Voice, and, and the, the label put them together to be a duo because there's a weakness in the duo category at the award shows every year, so it was fabricated. Okay. But they went all the way through, they made the records, they, they picked the songs from the best writers in town, they had the best musicians, the best producers, they put the whole thing together, they made their first two videos, and they're getting ready to release it, and one of the guys quits. And doesn't quit the act. Quits it all. Just... Not for everybody. No, it's not for it's everybody. It's a lot of pressure. Now, not to be completely sexist like I am, it's, it's usually women that I've heard happens, like... like if you've got a female, I, I, I'm hesitant to work as a producer with female artists because I have a lot of examples in this particular town of women who've done that. They've worked with a producer for years who's built them up and recorded them, gotten them signed, got the record company excited. The record company spends a million dollars on them. They're on the Keith Urban tour and they wake up. Like how Cheryl day. Crow got started, kind of. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, in this particular case, this person was the hottest thing since sliced bread in this town. She was on the hottest tour in the world. She had a number one video at CMT, and she got a phone call from her boyfriend, not even her husband, her boyfriend on the road a month into the tour, and she called the label and the managers and said, I'm quitting. I'm going to go home and be with my boyfriend. Yeah. So I mean, I've, I've actually never heard of that happening at that point in someone's career. Marilyn Munster. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened to the actress that was Mar the first Marilyn. Really? Did that Yeah, she, she was cast, never thought she'd get cast. And Mr. Boyfriend, so they're like, 
you know, basically Herman went to the network and said, she's miserable. Let her out of her contract or no the show's kidding. over. Yeah. Well, and this is not Yvonne DiCarlo, right? No, no. It was, uh, I forget the first Marilyn. Oh, yeah, my God. Patricia, I had the I biggest crush on Yvonne DiCarlo. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I don't know if you've ever seen any pictures of her before Lily Munster. I have. When, oh, Smoking beautiful. hot. Smoking hot. Anyways, I digress. I'm sorry. I could talk about Hollywood starlets forever. But, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, before we get off that, I, sure. I would like to say, like, you know, you brought up something, the dark side of, of the business that I really have thought of is like, you've been in the position where people have said, like, you know, they expected you to do something sexual in exchange for what they wanted. And it's like, it's, it doesn't just go one way in this town. Like, well, like, and like you said, it's been, it's happened for like men and women yeah, to well, you. It's like, God, how comfortable, uncomfortable would that be as a musician that you're like, okay, now I got to deal with this. Have you know, I business. ever been in a Weinstein situation? Yes, basically. <laughs> well, it's absolutely real. And, and the, yeah, absolutely. It's been uncomfortable. I, I'm sure I'm not alone in it. You know, it's the, the, I mentioned last time I talked to you, the casting couch is very real. Yeah. And, uh, and I still joke to this day, it seems like I've, I've only gotten into trouble when I didn't sleep with the girl. It's weird, you know. Um, you know, back when I was single and all that kind of stuff, you know, I was pretty crazy and and uh, you know had some fun and and stuff. But I've been in some situations where, like a like a TV series, let's say, hung in the balance of a meeting with the person who was in charge of the label, and I show up at her house the Friday before she's going to have a meeting in New York to actually greenlight it. We've been working on it for six months and, and revising the concept and doing the whole thing. And I, I go to her house to get a copy of the final treatment. And she sent her kids away for the weekend and has a little candlelit dinner for two, like, like waiting and stuff. And yeah, the tap dance of trying to politically get out of there without hurting feelings and, and stuff. And, and hurting your career. And, well, yeah, and, and, and it did, you know. I mean, I, I've had a lot of examples, unfortunately, where I wasn't gonna go down that road yeah. And, uh, and, you know, obviously that, um, you know, she, she had that meeting on, on that, uh, on that Monday in New York and it was her thumbs up or thumbs down and she gave it the thumbs down and I found out I, we were friends, you know? Yeah. I mean, and so I, I've been in that situation a lot. It's, it's happened a lot, but it's kind of part of being in this business. And the way I look at situations like that, there are certain there are certain scenarios you have to deftly navigate yourself through as best you can in order to get the music to the fans. In order to, you got to get past the gatekeepers. Yeah. And, and that's really, really always been the struggle for me and Matthew with our family karma is... Even now you were saying you're working on something now. Yeah, working on something right now. Which and is amazing. You let me hear a couple of the tracks which were amazing. I loved you, it. Thank you. Thank you. But it's very different. Just like Nelson was back in the day, yeah. This is very different from what people are doing in this particular town, which is Nashville. It is different. It's paradigm shifting, and, and I know wearing that hat is highly uncomfortable for most people in a record executive job because, again, if they put their stamp on something that's different or high profile or whatever, and it doesn't work, their yeah. career is over. Yeah. So we find ourselves all these years later in that same position. Which is ironic because, as I mentioned, I just did the liner notes on our greatest hits record from chapter one of our career. <laughs> so, obviously, our way of doing things, look, it worked out for Ozzy, you know, being a guy who realized I can't be a normal guy and do a network show and be beholden to the network and at their, their whim. I have to do my own thing. And he did it. He put Ozzy and Harriet together and did his own thing. I mean, this is an enterprising guy. If you think about, like, all the way back when when he had his big band and later had his number ones, he got his start by, there was a, a, it was a contest that was being held in the tri-state area for a place called the Glen Island Casino. And it was, up, up for grabs, was the residency at the Glen Island Casino for the entire summer. And Ozzy wanted that. There, were a, lot, there were a lot of bands that wanted that gig. And it was a, a newspaper contest. So the, you know, most of the, the, the act that got the most votes from from the people um, and basically what they had to do is take the, the last page of the newspaper and fill it out and send it in and then they would tally the votes and that would be the winner so Ozzy sent his entire band out to every newsstand in every county and bought <laughs> every copy 
filled it out and sent it in. And that's how his career was started. He was one of those guys. Yeah. He always found a way to do it. And, you know, our dad did the same thing, too. When he started, their whole philosophy was free milk and a cow. If kids would rock and roll was brand new, no one played it on TV. And, and you know, those that did, they couldn't get a record deal because the label executives thought, well, if the kids could see and hear it for free on TV, they're not going to go down and buy it. And Ozzy was convinced they were wrong. Our dad was on the number one TV show at the time and couldn't get a record deal. Wow. When he wanted to start singing. No one would give him a deal. So he finally did a deal, like a singles deal, with a jazz label, with Verve Records. Okay. Not, not a rock label, with no, a jazz label. Yeah. And made sure those singles were in stores. And they wound up selling a million copies that first week when the girl saw him singing on the show. And a whole new career was not only born, but a method for marketing music was proven. Our dad was full of a lot of firsts like that. And, and yet was inducted the second year into the Rock Hall and wasn't given a Grammy and all of that stuff. So you got to kind of go, you know, are we on some sort of, you know, industry no-fly list or something? Right, like a blacklist. I mean, there's, there, like. there's got to be. Like, I always felt that the powers that be during our first go-around, when we lucked into that opportunity on MTV and the fans spoke and the record company was caught with their pants down. They'd, or they'd only pressed 75,000 copies of After the Rain, which sold out the first day. And so it took them weeks to get caught back up again. So they really weren't planning on it to happen. But when the, when the money machine was rolling, I'm sure that the powers that be were like, well, we'll take the money. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to stop the roll, but this is great. We don't even have to put any money into it because we can sell all of the pictures that, that we've taken at all, with all the photographers to the teen magazines and they'll just go on it. And then you had other magazines like Metal Edge, which was kind of like the industry, you know, all the, the rockers used to read that. And that was a freebie as well. And we were kind of unfortunately marketed with the whole teen, you know, market. Yeah. Because it was an easy sell because we had the looks that we that we had. And they probably figured kids are, have no uh, bills, so they're just going to buy records. Sure, and sure. Money. And, and on the business side, I get that. But the thing that would have actually been very helpful to me and Matthew for the long run. Now, granted, none of these people thought we were going to be around at all, Yeah. you know, past that first flash. And like I said, we just did a greatest hits record, which is great. And we're still swinging. So that's, that's cool. But, um, but back in that day, I'm sure they thought, Hey, you know, we're going to, all the teen magazines, we're going to repurpose everything they've said in the legit music magazines. We're going to cut and paste, put that into the teen magazines. We never did for the record, a single interview at the time for a teen magazine ever. Wow. Every, every, all those interviews were cut from like Rolling Stone and, and all, you know, Billboard and all those articles and kind of repurposed and it sold a lot of records, okay? But it would have been very helpful had even our producer at the time, Mark Tanner, said in the interviews when he was asked, hey, how much of a hand in this did those boys have? Yeah. He should have said the truth. This is all them. They wrote this. You know, they actually mixed After the Rain, the, the song. You know, uh, none of those people, again, success has many parents, failure yeah. is an orphan. We were just happy to be out there doing it, you know. And frankly, once we got into that groove, it was so demanding and, and so high paced. We were just a couple of professionals doing a job. You know, we were soldiers getting it done. Every day we would wake up, our schedule was ridiculous. Um, when we were on the radio promo thing, I mean, we would do three states in a day. Wow. You know, we'd do morning radio in one state. We'd get be there for afternoon drive in a neighboring state and fly to another state for the evening show. And we did that every single day for like nine months. So I know you're a busy guy and I appreciate, you know, hanging out today. And one or two last questions. One was, um, you know, people had mentioned that they had seen your sister Tracy on... Um, some ghost shows talking about seeing things in the, the Flynn house and you had talked about things you felt But did you see anything? Well all of Tracy's stories and I think that you're mentioning like she did a TV show or something like that Yeah, they, those were my stories. Oh Really? Yeah, they were my stories. She totally stole my stories now I don't know uh, she she claims I think the only one that was real that she personally experienced Was uh, this is really like a legit and I thought this was really cool. She um, Bless her, she got really sick. She had cancer, but she was misdiagnosed. So uh, she, this is uh, when she was living at the Flynn house. Matt and I lived there a lot longer than she did. She was uh, like knocking on, uh, well, 18, 19 or something like that. But um, 
our father came to her in a dream. She had been to see a doctor, she was low energy and all that stuff, like six months earlier, who told her that she had mono. You got mono, go home, you're fine. And our father came to her in a dream and said, Tracy, you're really sick. You need to go see a doctor. And she remembers, like one of those dreams where, you, you know, it's kind of so real, you don't know if it's really happening or not. Yeah. But uh, and because the dream was happening, like in her bedroom, on her bed and all that stuff. So I really believe she got visited. And, um, and she said she pushed back a little bit, but, it, but then went to go see a different doctor for a second opinion who saw her lymph nodes and knew immediately she had Hodgkin's. Wow. And she was stage four at that time. But that visitation, the important <laughs> one, saved her life. That hey, saved her life. Did you ever see him in the house? Um, no, I saw and experienced other things, you know, but I have different stories. It wasn't just at the Flynn house. We, we lived, my mom had this habit of picking haunted houses. I don't know what that was all about. Like we had a house down in Laguna Beach. Like drawn was, to them? <laughs> I, she was, it was crazy. And, and I've always been really sensitive to it. So I always seem to be kind of like the lightning rod for all that kind of activity. I still am to this day. Wow. You know, I, I experience a lot of that and that's a whole different thing that we've got to do. But to answer your question, absolutely. You know, if you listen to those stories, just assume that they're all mine. Okay. And uh, they all pretty much happened to me. I was really the kid that, that, that had all that stuff happen to him. Wow. But um, what's fascinating to me looking back on it is that I was really kind of balanced about it when it was going on. You know, there was some scary stuff that happened, but I wasn't all as scared I wasn't as scared as I was wanting to make contact. Interesting. And wanting to connect. No fear. That's great. Not, not really. Not really. I mean, I, I've seen it. I had a disembodied woman float into my room as a kid. Wow. You know, every night for a month. And Any, anything that she would say, or was it just? No, it was. Or? It was weird. It was like one of these like apparitions that had. It was like she was blowing in the wind and stuff. Something out of a movie. It was crazy. And I thought I'd made it up. Wow. And, and all that stuff, because I only remembered it happening one time. And it was at a house before the Flynn house. It was a house that was in the San Fernando Valley. And it was uh, 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 built in, it was like one of the oldest houses in the valley. It was a farmhouse. And, uh, and it, it had a lot of history to it. And my mom actually hired a psychic to, to help at that particular point. I was really young. I was five or six. And I only remember one time where... Um, I looked at the, the clock because my dog was at the foot of my bed. Um, we all had our individual bedrooms and stuff. I was in a small bedroom in the middle of this uh, giant, what used to be the master suite on the top floor that they'd segmented off to have enough bedrooms for the kids. And my dog went crazy in the middle of the night. I looked up, it was like two or three in the morning or something like that. And the door opened and this woman kind of floated in and was there at the foot of my bed. And it looked like she was trying to say something and couldn't, the dog was going nuts. Wow. And all that stuff. And then she kind of floated back out of the room after a while, leaving the door open. And I ran down the hall to my parents' room, knocked on the door. And my mom said years later, um, she said, you were white as a sheep, eyes this big. Uh, you weren't making it up. This, yeah. this, this is what you perceived. She, and I said, yeah, that happened at one time. Did it ever come back? She goes, it didn't happen at one time. That happened every, you were knocking on my door every night for a month. Wow. She hired a, a psychic to come in. The psychic came in, they did some research on the house. And they found out that three people over the history of the house, they could find in newspapers and stuff, three people had died. And one of the, the people uh, had died being dragged to death in the corral by a horse. Uh, another person accidentally fell through the hole in the hayloft, accidentally died. And the last person to die was the mistress of the house that was actually poisoned by her servants. And what they figured out was where her bed would have been in that master bedroom before it had gotten segmented off for us kids, where my bed was, was right where her bed would have been. So the psychic figured, it got, and all of a sudden she said, she's afraid for you. Yeah. She's oh, worried wow. about you. So if it happens again, I want you to, to, to tell her that you know and that you're aware and that you're safe and to thank her. And apparently I did that and she never came back. Very interesting. Yeah. So I mean, that's just one of a million stories. Yeah. But we could, we could definitely connect on that. One other thing that people were asking about is, did you or Matthew uh, ever develop a fear of flying because of how your father... Legit question, man. Legit question. Uh, I have been very close. Um, I've been always fatalistic about flying. You know, we got to get to the fans one way or another. And, and I really do believe... I'm, 
My relationship with God is great, and I know where I'm going, and I know who I'm going to see. I, I'm just not all that anxious to go there quite yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's how I feel. But, but uh, you know, in order to do what we do, you have to fly to get there and drive. And I was planes, trains, and automobiles and stuff. Yeah. But I try to minimize the risk, but I really do believe that when it's my time, it's my time. But that's why to date, I never freak out if my plane is canceled or something like that. I truly believe God's got me in the hollow of his hands. And if I'm not meant to be on that flight, I'm not meant to be on that flight. And I've had a couple of, of experiences uh, actually that are online. I actually filmed one time. I mean, we had a bad fuel fill when we were in the Caribbean coming back with a songwriters group. And, um, and both engines actually stopped working at altitude. And we barely made land. We actually fell for about eight minutes. I thought I would not fly for a long time after that. That was, that was freaky. You should ask Billy Ray Cyrus about it. He was on the plane with us, and Miley was there too, and all these people. And, and apparently when we got off the plane, um, Miley had said, um, I, I felt like we were going to be okay because my dad turned to me when this was all happening. The lights were off, and we were falling, and the pilot had said, we're going to try to make land, and we're over water, and all that stuff. It was really scary. And Billy had apparently turned to her and said, you know what, we're going to be just fine. The Nelson boys are on this plan. The good Lord wouldn't do that to the same family twice. That's right. And I love that. I thought That's that was great. very That's cool. so cool. And the second time we were taken off from LAX, and this was not that long ago. It was about six or seven years ago, and this is the one that's online. Um, I always like sitting in the exit row. You know, I want to be in the hero seat. Not so I can get out first, but I can help people out. Yeah. And, uh, and we were taking off, and there was a big boom underneath us as we were taking off. It was a huge explosion right under where we were sitting. And uh, it turns out that our landing gear had exploded on takeoff. Ooh. And so they couldn't pull it up in the plane and they couldn't bring it down or anything like that. And so we wound up flying around the tower a couple of times so they could do a visual on it. And, and we were in trouble. And we actually flew for six hours. We had a, a, a fuel, a, a full fill of the fuel because we were going all the way to Nashville from LA. And we decided, or the pilot decided, rather than try to fix it in Nashville and do an emergency landing there, they had the international runway at LAX, which was safer and longer. So we just flew around for like six hours to burn off fuel and then made an emergency landing. And the pilot was great. We all got to the other side of the plane off the weight and all that stuff. It was, but it was scary. Jeez. There have been a couple of close calls, but you're also talking to the guy who had his like first parachute not open. You know, I, I you what? Know, oh, I've got tons of stories. You know, I believe we'll save the Lord that one for another time. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe the Lord has put me here for a really good reason for this time in history, right here and right now. And uh, I'm, I don't tempt fate, but uh, I'm not scared of it either. You know, I'm, I'm really not. I'm not scared of this industry. I'm not scared of a good fight. I'm not scared of proving my music. Um, doing things differently because I love people and I love what it is I, I do, you know. Um, but it takes a lot to scare me. I'm not, I'm not daring anybody by any means, but, uh, but, you know, hey, being here as long as I've been, in this business as long as I've been, from this family that I'm from, man, uh, it's like that great country song, it, you know, if you're going to be tough, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, we've done a lot of dumb things, but we've had a lot of laughs. I am the luckiest guy in the world, you know, with all of the ups and downs, um, with all the people that have come in and out of my life that I've been lucky enough to encounter, both the good people and the bad people, both the proponents and the enemies. All of these people have, have helped me really kind of like focus on what's important to me. And these are crazy times that we're living in right now. The world is Jumanji. This is insane what's going on right now. And once again, I've got my twin brother and, you know, my family and my music. And that's really the true north in, in my compass, you know, that's, that's really kept me sane through this whole thing. Um, the other stuff is, is great. I mean, coming from Hollywood and coming from all those sordid stories and, and that, that underbelly uh, that's dark, it's there. Yeah. It's there. And I've never done the deal. I never will do the deal. Good. And if that puts me on a no-fly list or something like that, if I'm on a blacklist for that, okay. I'm fine with that. That's cool. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just one of those guys that don't feel like uh, not only would I never, uh, you know, do something that, uh, or make, a, make an agreement with some powerful people that I would come to regret years later. Um, you know, I, I don't, I've, of course, made some mistakes. But I've never had to sell out. Yeah. 
And uh, there are a lot of ways you can sell out, but I've never had to sell out and I've never hurt anybody intentionally. And that makes me feel good. Well, on the, on the sign, or uh, you know, as you're saying sell out, let's go to my last question. Sure. In a couple of days, I will see uh, our mutual good friend, Eric Singer. And uh, you were responsible for him losing his job with Kiss at one point. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. You can't prove that. You want to mention that? I, I'm jo you know, I'm joking because yeah. uh, you know, Kiss is known as just one of those bands that will sell anything, uh, put their name on anything, but God, we uh, love them. Well, I love those guys. I love all of them. Um, you know, we used to have a, a really good relationship with both Paul and with Gene. Um, we were managed by the same manager at the time. And Matthew and I hadn't released yet, but we went to a show they had at the Long Beach uh, Arena. And it was, it was fantastic. We had just done our MTV thing and stuff, so we caused kind of a commotion when we went there and stuff. But uh, I remember having a conversation with Gene in his dressing room uh, before they all went on. I, I think that night it was, um, definitely Winger was playing. It might have been Slaughter, Winger, and Kiss. It might have been that. Mark's my best friend. And like it would have been Gene, Paul, Eric, and Bruce. Correct. During that, that would have been, that and that was makeup, makeup off time. Yeah, that was makeup off time, and and uh, Gene and I, he he seemed a little despondent, and we were having a conversation about business and all that kind of stuff, and and uh, I, I guess a word has he was kind of like looking out. It was a little more thin than it had been at, at other times. The crowd as much. Yeah, a little yeah. bit, you know, a little, and he was complaining about it, and I and I just off the cuff said, you know, Gene, if you guys would, no one wants to see that face. Come on. <laughs> I said, you know, and we laughed about it. I said, look, in seriousness, if you were to put the makeup back on, spit the blood, walk through the fire, there isn't a person fair I know. Tour. <laughs> call it the fair, whatever you want to do, but do that. There isn't a person I know that wouldn't pay a thousand dollars to come see that show, just one time. And he's like, you, you really think so? It's like, oh my God, of course. I mean, it's Kiss. You know, yeah. I mean, I I, I put on the war paint when. I was in grade school, sixth grade, man. I was you in sixth grade. It was killer. And, uh, and, and I don't know if that conversation had anything to do with it, but they did put the makeup back on. And we, again, we were with the same management company, but it's the greatest marketing in the entire world. I'm not, I'm not saying that those guys aren't incredibly talented because they, they are. It's just one of those things. It's like, you know, you give the, give the fans what they want. Yeah. And, and the KISS fans are very clear on what they want. You know, they want kiss. Mm -hmm. They cool. they want the pageantry. They 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 want they want the demon. They and want thank the, God because there's nobody else doing exactly, that like them, exactly exactly. So. And they've earned it. You know, they they have they've earned it. And they're they're such great guys. And man, so much respect. They're still doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just curious. I'm I'm speculating. You know, I, I don't know if Gene's son I mean, with the makeup it allows you it affords you some opportunity to keep that seventy five keep that, years old. He's still doing it. Well, you know what? You could also replace yourself or somebody else and I speculate that's what will happen well, maybe, maybe I Nick, think at maybe. some point there will be like a uh, you will audition to be the KISS touring band well you know? maybe it wouldn't surprise maybe me. and maybe not maybe if maybe if Nick is in it as Gene very very possible that's yeah I don't know I don't know stranger things have happened I'd still go see that show like Eric told me one time he said I just have a hard time believing when it's all said and done that Gene and Paul will be willing to like hey we'll just sell the name to a company and they can do everything with it. He's like, I think that they'll still want to have hands on. Oh, I think so. Things. I think so. You know, look, honestly, it's like we all have this, this common thread that we, we just love what we do. You know, I, I, I know money is the great motivator and, and for some, <laughs> for some more than most, but, um, that said, you know what? They're just a bunch of kids too, who love playing rock and roll. Yeah. And we're fortunately a bunch of kids that love listening to them playing rock and roll. So it's just, it's a win-win for everybody. Gunner, thank you so much, well, man. This was always. so fun. Thank you. We will see you next time. And actually, you have a cameo that if people want to get a personal message or or uh, you to sing a song for them, they can go on Cameo. Well, that's the, that's the start. Yeah, find, find me on Cameo. I, I'm definitely really reachable, and I can do the normal Cameo thing. But I've just started this thing called Cameo Calls, where you can get 10 minutes of my time to talk about whatever you want. If you want a song or just a visit or whatever, that's totally cool, too. Awesome, man. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you.